<laughs> Everybody's ready. Uh, so uh, welcome to uh, I, I can believe we're in a uh, meeting about surviving disasters. Uh, I'm Darren Johnson. I am the uh, section uh, secretary and the newsletter editor. A um, couple notes here. First off, uh, we got a couple upcoming events. Um, tomorrow we have a web, uh, webinar at 6 p.m. on uh, ransomware. Uh, next week we have one on the 21st, which we'll talk, be talking about uh, electric vehicles. And also uh, we're starting the planning right now and it's going pretty hot and heavy about uh, a STEM event that we have uh, October 9th uh, it's, uh, is to get girls more involved in uh, STEM. Uh, so we're looking for volunteers for that. Uh, all of those activities are on our website. If you register and uh, click the uh, send me email button, you'll be getting notices about them. Uh, if you have any questions during the meeting, uh, go ahead and use the Q&A box. Um, uh, if it asks you who to send the, send the question to, go ahead and click all panelists. I'll be uh, sorting through those. So um, questions for the speaker, I'll be reading. If it's like logistical questions, I'll answer those privately. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Natalie Gossett. Natalie is uh, past chair of uh, Blaine Ventura section. Uh, she's uh, had a number of other roles, particularly in the EMBS chapter, and she's currently our uh, program lead for our engineering resilience to wildfires uh, disasters uh, program. So, Natalie. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. So tonight, uh, tonight's program is an uh, initiative supported by the IEEE Foundation. Uh, which is the philanthropic arm of IEEE, and we have been honored, uh, our section has been honored with a grant to organize events to raise uh, the awareness of what we can do to engineer resilience to drought and wildfires. So I have the pleasure to introduce our speaker. I, I met Ross Cosson uh, 18 years ago. Um, and Ross was already known for making historical breakthroughs in digital communications with first deployments of VoiceOver X25, first deployment of VoiceOver Frame Relay, and launching revolutionary technologies that, that enable long haul fiber optics communications. And Ross' passion for leading a career of impact continues today. Uh, Ross Cosson is the course director of First On Screen Training. He works locally, nationally, and internationally with agencies to teach how to be prepared for emergencies and disasters. He's on the board of the Business Industry Council for Emergency Planning and Preparedness. He's the president of the Valley Coastal Chapter of the American Society of Safety Professionals. He has been a National Registry EMT since 2004. Since college, Ross has been involved in pre-hospital care when he worked on first rescue squad for Bridgehampton Raceway. He completed intensive fire rescue course in extrication. He is a third party provider of health and safety courses from the American Heart Association, the American Red Cross, and Emergency Safety Care Institute. And Ross is a PADI rescue diver and an active member of the Ventura County Medical Reserve Corps and the Southern Oaks Disaster Assistance Response Team. We couldn't have had a better speaker tonight to talk about disasters, be part of the solution and not part of the problem. I'll let you, Ross, I'll let you move forward. Okay. So she had mentioned uh, the Bridgehampton racetrack. I lived on Long Island while I was in college. I participated in that. And I look back and I got to wear the Nomex suit and I thought it was a big deal until I realized I was the only one skinny enough to fit into it and young enough and foolish enough to wear it. But nevertheless, it was still fun. So I define the world as kind of what is the definition of success? So I will be successful tonight's talk when I scare you into doing something 
to prepare for the next disaster. That could be getting a case of water, that could be putting together a disaster plan, that could be putting together a food supply, whatever it is that I want you to do something, because something is better than nothing. Because if you do nothing, you will be part of the problem and you will not be part of the solution. And so today what we're gonna talk about a little bit on the personal side, intermingled with things for businesses and what businesses can do. And then depending on where you live, what kind of disasters in Southern California, you might be more prone to. So basically we want to sit there and say, what do we need to do? And so right now is the time when we're not in the middle of a disaster, in the middle of a problem for us to sit there and to make a plan. You have to sit down and look at your environment, figure out what are some of the risks, what are some of the issues that you have, and to start to write things down. The next you wanna do is you wanna to start to get the emergency supplies. You don't wanna wait until there is nothing. So a hurricane just came across uh, Florida and up the East Coast, and people were taking the water, they were getting their generator, they are getting their supplies, and you're the last person there, you're not getting any of those supplies. You want to start to sit there and say, what do I need for the type of disaster that I might face here in Southern California? So also what you want to do is sit there. And now is the time to practice the plan. So it might sound good on paper, but go through some drills, go through some scenarios and say, what about this? What about that? And just kind of do a dry run to see what's going on. But what you normally want to do is figure out who's going to do what. And this is especially important at a company. You want to find out who's on your emergency response team. Who can be sitting there and, and learn first aid CPR? Who can help with managing the disaster? Who can help with the disaster recovery? There's so often things happen. So, I had not joined the company, but there was a company uh, that was located up in Simi Valley when they had the big earthquake a couple of years back, quite a few years back, and they were down the street from Costco up in Simi Valley. And all of a sudden, they got a skylight in their building. Basically, the building was trashed. And the executives had enough plans to figure out who was going to do what. So on their executive staff, one person found a moving truck. He climbed in the passenger seat and would not leave while the guy had other projects to do with moving for a day or two until they were able to move them. Another person had an RV, one of the executives, so they pulled it into the parking lot. Another person had some others that went out looking for a building and where to move, and they ended up having to move somebody else out of the building that they wanted to move into. But they assigned roles to be able to react and be able to do it, because if not, I used them at the small, small to medium-sized startup they would have been out of business. So this is the time to figure out what's going on. Figure out who your disaster supplies are, what are you trying to do? So there's a huge difference of making up a plan as you go and improvising a plan. No plan is perfect, and there's no disasters gonna follow the guidelines that you want. But if you don't have a framework, if you don't have at least some initial idea of what you wanna do and everybody that needs to implement it has an initial idea of what they're doing, and then you can modify it as you go, you're gonna be in trouble because everybody's gonna immediately have their own ideas of what to do, and it's gonna be really full chaos in the middle of chaos. And so this is where making the plan, preparing for it, practicing it, and assigning roles of what you wanna be able to do. So we live here in SoCal. We have our four seasons, fire, mudslides, floods, and earthquakes. Uh, along with the sunshine and the weather. But we do now, fire seasons is now taking place year round. And it's a cycle. The fires come, they burn the undergrowth, the rains come, you get the mudslides and the flood, and then the earthquake is just thrown in there because it can. And we haven't had a big one for a while, but when we do, it's gonna disrupt majorly what's going to happen in our lives. If you even look at the traffic now on the 101 in Thousand Oaks, on a sunny beach day, it's bumper to bumper traffic. Now add to the fact that there are some disasters, it's, it's gonna be total chaos. So you wanna look at some of the hazards that we have. We have a lot, uh, as every place around the world do. We fortunately don't have uh, hurricanes or tornadoes, but we have our sets of earthquakes, we have fires, we have power outages. And this is one of the things that we're seeing more and more of. So 
there are two, well, there's a couple of different types of power outages. One that are caused by nature, by wind storms, by uh, hail, by snow, or different types of stuff. And then there are those that are done, I don't want to say on purpose, but on purpose. And those are the public safety power shutoffs. And there are two sides of that. One is we're overdoing our grid, so we want to purposely shut people's power off. And then there's the other where the electric company is tired of getting sued because it started a fire because of the high winds. So they say, well, we'll solve that problem when there's high winds up in Ojai or off the different areas. Instead of burning down the area, we're just going to shut the power off. And that's the power safety, power shutoff capability. And so they let people know about it because we know when high winds are coming, but they're trying to do that. So you can't sue the power company and uh, still have power on these situations. It's kind of a, a tough one for now. Floods, uh, what's happening now is all of the, what I would call good land or premium land in Southern California is built on. And now people want to build in Southern California. So they say, geez, let's go to Camarillo Springs and let's just build some houses in and up along the river and guess what happens? We have a flood and now their houses are full of mud. I mean, it's just, they should not have been allowed to build there, but people are doing that all the time. So we're getting floods, uh, we're getting over from the water. Uh, in a business, water damage. So one of my customers, there was a huge main water pipe that came into the building that burst, and it can cause a whole lot of damage when you have a six inch water pipe that is just constantly flooding the area. Uh, you look in the news a couple years back, there were the floods from fire hydrants and other areas or broken water pipes. Uh, at UCLA, where they flooded the gym, they flooded the parking lots. Our infrastructure in Southern California, in some parts of it, is extremely old. And water pipes, electrical systems are starting to fail more and more. Um, theft, if you're a business, on how you're dealing with things. We've had the riots. Uh, we've had other types of areas where there's just massive type of theft. Uh, security risks. And again, having access into people's buildings, being able to do different things from that. Uh, just the whole issue that as you look at not only the fires and other types of issues, but other types that happen. And then obviously the active shooter is a new one that's come up on the radar uh, relatively recently. And so everybody in your organization should know what to do, where to go and do things. I mean, with active shooter, the general rule is run, hide, fight. So if you can run, you can run away, if you can hide. If you hide, the first thing you do is take your phone and turn the ringer off because you could have the best hiding spot and now all of a sudden a loved one is calling to say, are you okay? And it rings and the active shooter says, oh, there you are in the closet. So people have to think about that. Um, if you look at uh, Sandy Hook, uh, which was a very tragic thing that happened on the East Coast, it was unfortunate that the people had tunnel vision. The building was a single story building. There were doors, a hallway and a door going into the room and in the back of the room were glass windows. And no one thought of taking a chair or a lot of them were open to, to be opened anyway and busting open a window and throwing those little kids out and let them run into the parking lot, into the thing, to the playground or whatever. And that could have saved a lot of people, but they said, oh, I can't possibly break the window. They didn't think about that. So. You need to have situation awareness. You have to sit there and say, if I have to get out of some place, how am I going to do it? And not always the door. So just think where you're at and what you want to do for your survival. So during a disaster, uh, what's going to happen is first, there's not going to be any power. So you need to think about what are you going to do about power? Do you have a backup generator? Do you have backup electricity? I have a lot of little power cubes that I use to power my phone. I have the capability to power the phone in the car, but you know, what are you gonna do for any long-term power type of things? How are you gonna deal with that? There's not gonna be any water. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that, but what is your water supply? Where are you gonna get it? And this is the drinkable water for using it. You're not gonna have food. If you look at your house, what you have, how long could you survive before you have to go to Costco to get more food? There's not gonna be any internet that's gonna go down. There's going to be limited to no communication. So now how many people have a ham radio? And since they did away with the Morse code requirement, 
it's now very simple or easier to get a ham radio license. Uh, the federal government and the FCC has posted 100% of the questions that they can ask you on the test online, and all you have to do is study the to the bank, and then one of the questions that they're going to ask is in that bank. So they told you what the answers are, and you could study and kind of learn to get your ham radio license. The ham radio will be one of the few things that will stay up versus the communication network. Um, you're not going to be doing any travel. I mean, just look what the COVID did. It just shut down travel. And that was, an, you know, it was a natural disaster, it was an international disaster, but those are the types of things that can happen. Um, there's not going to be any cash machine. There's not going to be any ATMs running. So I would encourage you, if you can afford it, is to take twenty, a hundred, fifty to hundred dollars and get it in singles. And the reason I say singles is that if you need to barter for a bottle of water and you have a single, you have a better chance of getting a bottle of water. If you only have a twenty or a bunch of twenties, guess what? Magically, whoever you're bartering with does not have change. So get a whole bunch of singles and find a safe place to put them to be able to use that because we're going to turn to a cash system very, very quickly. And then as we all learned last year, guess what? There's not going to be any toilet paper. It still amazes me on why people bought toilet paper during the COVID. It was not one of the symptoms or the things that could help you with that. But I think it was a creature feature that people said, hey, um, I want to get that. And so Toilet paper was a commodity. And if you looked at the supply chain of getting toilet paper, and there is a factory that's in, in Oxnard, working, toilet paper factory, it is a bulky, lightweight item that has to be manufactured close to the distribution because it can't be shipped. I mean, it, a truckload doesn't carry that much toilet paper because of the bulk of it. Uh, but at the same time, the manufacturer has got his manufacturing line tuned that for him to automatically change that would cost them much more than the return that he would get. So it turned out that they were selling reject toilet paper, which they normally would throw away or discard, and people were buying it up. So, and that would be rolls that were crushed or things that weren't folded correctly. You know, it's kind of not the perfect ones. And so during a disaster, people settle for a lot less, which is kind of interesting. So during a disaster or a situation, you kind of go through some stages. And I want to point out there's a book called The Unthinkable. And it is a really well-written book where they she took a whole bunch of different disasters and dissected them and said what went well, what didn't go well, how did people react? And it really was quite interesting on, on how she did all of that. But initially, people are in denial. I can't possibly be having an issue here. And they start procrastinating and they start looking at the risks and figuring out what to do, where to go, and how to do things through their deliberation. There's fear, there's groupthink, and we as humans are herd animals. If we see somebody going in a direction, we're going to follow, whether it's the right direction or the wrong direction. And that's a challenge because the person leading maybe just as clueless as the person in the back and you're going down the wrong step. And so you should sit there and in your situation and figure out what's the best for me and how do I solve the problem for me and not necessarily be caught into this group thing. And then you have the decisive moment of panic and where you're going. I was watching on YouTube yesterday about the, there's a lady that survived the collapse of the, the condo building in Florida. And she's an elderly woman. Uh, I have to say that because I'm old now, but she appeared to be a little amazed, but I can call her an elderly woman. Um, she heard some things. She looked out her window and said, this is not right. She didn't do a lot of procrastinating. She picked up, she went, grabbed her flashlight, and right by her door, she has her pocketbook. She walked up in the hallway. And she started to see the dust collecting and the different smoke. She went down the hall to see her friend. The friend wasn't there. And then she started to go down to the garage to be able to go out of the building, at which point she hit water. She was ankle deep or knee deep in water. And she said, yeah, this is not a good idea. But she came back upstairs and was able to go up to the third floor, went into a room that was open, uh, went out to the balcony and sat there and found the fire people that were down on the ground floor. They were able to bring the fire truck up with the ladder and the basket. 
and were able to rescue her and a bunch of other people. And she sat there and went through these denials of liberation and just like, and she basically said, I can't panic if I want to survive. And she had the wherewithal to be able to do that. And if more people had that capability, then more people would be able to survive. So you have to sit there and say, during an earthquake, where am I going to survive? What am I going to do? And so when you go into a facility, you go into a building, you go into your home, you have to sit there and say, all right, when the ground starts moving, where am I going that I can be survived? Where can I be? What, what can happen? What can I do? Where can I go? And so basically for the employees and even yourself, you need to practice evacuation. You need to have people trained in first aid and CPR that can give immediate care. It will be a while, depending on the size and the magnitude of the disaster, before first responders show up. Now, on a normal day when there isn't a disaster, here in Southern California and primarily in South and Oakland, Westlake Village, the response time is probably three to five minutes. And when you call 911, you're going to get seven people just to help you. The first that shows up is the fire truck. And in there, uh, the driver, he or she is the engineer. Middle age, middle career, uh, they get the drive, which is kind of cool, and they get to play with all the knobs and buttons on the fire truck. Then you have the captain. He or she sits in the shotgun seat. They do as little work as possible, but they've earned it because they're more seasoned. And they really sit back and are the safety person. They're collecting information, but if you've ever watched on the scene, they step back and they're making sure their team is there. And then in the back is the firefighter. So he or she, they schlep all the gear. That's the monitor, the go bag, the drugs, the O2 tank, the backboard. But they're so happy to be firefighters, they do it. All three of them are EMTs, emergency medical technicians. Then you get the little pickup truck. That's the squad. Uh, in there are two paramedics. And then in Ventura County, we have AMR. And in there is at least one paramedic and most of the time two paramedics uh, to help you. And so they can stay on scene depending on the type of scenario, typically a medical call, for an hour. They can push drugs, they can do different care, so they don't have to drag you to the hospital uh, right away. Now, trauma is a whole different situation. A lot of medical calls, they can definitely be there. And because we're right on the vicinity of the L.A. County, Ventura County line, is there's a fire station by the Oaks Mall, there's a fire station by Moore Park and an Avenue to Arbless, there's a fire station up in Oak Park, there's a um, L.A. County fire by St. Jude's. There's another one in Canewood. And there's another one uh, further off uh, by um, Canaan Road. So there's a lot of fire departments really close and local to be able to help us. Um, so everybody should be aware of fire safety, figuring out how to use a local fire extinguisher or how to evacuate the building. Uh, what are the security procedures? You know, that well, how are you going to get in secure that everybody's uh, out of the building, everybody's accounted for. And then not so much on the personal needs, but data backup procedures. What is your process and procedures to back up your data, back up important documents to keep the company going? And then more importantly, who is gonna do what? And so again, you need to sit down and when you're not in the middle of a disaster where things are calm and collective and figure out right now, this, this, or this, and have backup in case that person's on vacation, they leave the company, new people come. But that's something that needs to be constantly reviewed and looked at because these are the companies that are going to survive versus the companies that are not. People adapt. There are some companies that adapted very well to the COVID-19 where they were able to have a lot of their people work from home. There are a lot of companies that had challenges with that. And so you'll see who's surviving and at what cost they're doing that. So the seven steps of resiliency. So you basically can sit there and you need to look around your building. You need to look around your home. What are the potential hazards? Where am I? Where am I situated? Am I in an area that's close to wildfires? My uh, old house when we lived um, off of Lindero Canyon, uh, the fire went completely, we had sold it fortunately, but it went completely around our neighborhood. We had 13 homes back there and the fires were burning in my neighbor's backyard. And so that was, and it was clear. Every year, the Home Association cleared the back of the brush, but even with that, the home was there. You wanna sit there and create a plan, and you wanna sit there and do it. So many times on a home that you hear stories about a couple that the husband goes out the back door, the wife goes out the front door because there's a fire or there's a disaster, 
and they don't see each other and they immediately they run back in and then they get caught up in the fire. And so you sit there and say, no, if we're going to have a plan, we're going to meet at the mailbox, we'll meet at the corner at this intersection. So everybody knows what to do and where to go and not to run back in the house and get into more trouble. Um, again, the supplies, everybody knows that there's disaster, but you don't have to buy these elaborate kits. You can buy most of the stuff at a common department store or Costco or big box store. Uh, and you don't have to buy it all at once. Just start buying by a little bit and find a nice place to store it, rotate it, keep it in stock. And again, that's why when the COVID happened, I keep two whole, two whole big things of toilet paper at my house, two big things of paper towels, two cases of water, uh, and along with some other water and other supplies. So I didn't have to run and get in line in the middle of the COVID thing to try to find the last remaining roll of toilet paper. Um, so in the business side of things, you want to look at what are some of your weaknesses and start to fix them. How old the building is, and again, it's a lot. Is it do I own the building? Am I a tenant in the building? But you need to figure out what is there, what the issues are. Uh, figuring out what exits are there, what's working, what's not working, and, and start to, to look at those issues and start to address them. They're not going to get addressed by themselves, and during a disaster, you're going to find out all the weaknesses at once, and that's not the time to start to find them. Um, so during a disaster, obviously, life is the most important thing. You want to protect yourself and your employees during a disaster. So if it's a fire, if it's a flood, if it's an earthquake, what are you doing? How are you doing this? How are you dealing with it? One of the issues that has not really been well addressed, and that is with everybody working at home, how far should the employees reach into their employees' homes to make sure that they're safe? So they're still, still employees of the company, and it's a kind of fine line if I don't want to intrude into my employee's house, but maybe I should sit there and have a questionnaire to say, do you have a fire extinguisher at your house? Do you have adequate water and food supplies if you have the shelter in place? You know, where you're at, because without your employees, you do not have a company. Um, and then after the initial disaster, you want to check for injuries, you want to see who's there, what's going on, where things are from that. Um, and then again, once things have settled down, you can start to go into the building and do different things. But if you don't have access to your phone system, if you don't have access to your data system, you're in trouble. Now, granted, a lot has changed with the cloud computing and people can be able to access things remote, but there's still a lot of people have servers in their facility that need to be addressed and be able to dealt with. So the 10 essentials, um, and again, you want to look at it from your home, your car, and your business. And so you need water, one to two gallons per person. Uh, it's a typical starting point. Uh, food, you need at least seven days to three weeks. If you think people are coming, they're not. If you think you're going to be able to get food, you're not. Um, one of the things that's interesting is Walmart has their own weather team and weather station, uh, and they monitor the weather. And when they see uh, tornado warnings or primarily hurricanes, they contact Kellogg and they start shipping strawberry um, pop tarts to those locations. They know that people go out buying strawberry pop tarts as their comfort food, and so. People are evacuating the area, and there are trucks with Walmart bringing in pop stars, which is kind of cool. Um, you want to find out where your cash and important documents are. More and more is online, but at the same time, you're going to need certain documents to be able to start anew, if it were, uh, in a good place. Um, what kind of clothes you have? You should have like a go bag with some minimal amount of clothes so that if you have to evacuate, because of a wildfire or because of any other disaster, do I have a go back or do I now have to waste precious time trying to figure out, well, what outfit goes with a raging fire versus what outfit goes with a flood coming in? So you want to be able to make those decisions way ahead of time so that you have the proper attire for the proper event. Um, light sources. So how many people have lights? Your phone is great but you're eating up your battery on your phone. So maybe you don't want to necessarily do that. Uh, if you do have flashlights, it's a good idea to store the batteries outside the flashlight because if you don't change them periodically, they will uh, 
have a problem with the flashlight. And again, just thinking out smart. So taking the plastic baggie, putting the batteries and taping it or using rubber band next to the flashlight is not a bad idea. It just takes a few minutes to put the batteries into the flashlight. Um, first aid kits, uh, again, everybody should have them. Uh, one of the things that I use is a Coban, which is the, the tape that you can use uh, a lot of times when you go to the doctor and you give blood or, or you, they take blood away or whatever that they're doing in a blood draw, they'll put this tape on you. It's great because it doesn't stick to your skin. It only sticks to itself and four by fours or gauze pads. Uh, that can pretty much save the world. You also need a tourniquet. Uh, tourniquets are relatively inexpensive, but can help save your life. So in my car, by the driver's side, I have a tourniquet. In every one of my first aid kits, I have a tourniquet. Because if I'm going to bleed out, or somebody else is going to bleed out, uh, a tourniquet saves them. You will bleed out from a lower extremity in probably four to eight minutes, or four to six minutes, and uh, upper one, probably eight to ten minutes. Um, anybody that saw that wonderful medical movie, Black Hawk Down, the Marine died because the femoral artery got nicked and the medic couldn't reach up high enough to clip the artery. And so every time the heart pumped, it pumped went from his heart and eventually found its way to the femoral artery and pumped out. And in six to eight minutes, he died because they weren't able to do it. Now, in that case, a tourniquet wouldn't have helped if it was too high up. But nevertheless, that just shows you how quickly you can bleed out. Um, medicine. Um, you want to make sure that you have supplies uh, for that. It used to be there were five medical pharmaceutical distribution areas here in Southern California. Two were in Valencia, one was in Orange County, and the rest were in the LA area. So now if there's an earthquake or a fire, like the five is closed because of fires and stuff like that, they're not going to be able to get the education. Your pharmacy stocks the normal everyday uh, things that most people have, uh, but the more unique ones, it takes a couple of days to do, but they only have a couple of days supply of the most common medications that people are on. And so you need to make sure that if you need your medications, that you have a backup supply or you have the capabilities to, to acquire that. Um, again, communications can be huge. How many people have a radio or a portable radio that is rechargeable or on a hand crank because that's one of the few ways that you're going to be able to get information. Again, the internet's going to go down, your cell phones are going to go down. Um, and then the last thing you really want to start to talk about is your personal hygiene. Uh, even your best friends are going to start to uh, want to be social distanced after a couple of days without proper hygiene. So just keep that in mind. Uh, tools, uh, basic tools, and we're not looking at you know, all the major things, but we're looking at crowbar, really gloves, goggles, uh, different things to be able to get you out of a building or a collapsed thing or uh, to help somebody else in the neighborhood. So in the office, um, again, you can store bought kit and you can put them together yourself, but basically depending on the size of the company. And a lot of this has changed because of COVID-19, less and less people are physically going into buildings, but if you do any form of manufacturing, it's really hard for the machinist to work from home in his living room with the mill or the lathe or the punch press. Uh, office workers have a tendency to be able to remote work, but a lot of people cannot do that. So do you have enough, depending on how many people you have and how many days that you might have to shelter in place? Do you have cots or hammocks for people to hang out with? What kind of first aid, food, water, different things that you have? When I go to shop, I look for the expiration dates. So chili that I like basically has a shelf life of three years. So the chili that's in my shelf right now is good for 2023, 2024. Um, there's pop ramen, there's tuna fish in a packet, all those types of things that are great for it. Uh, water, depending on what type of source you have, is uh, typically good for five years. I have a person that I, I work with, uh, and her company, they sell uh, it's called Blue Can Water. I don't a shout out for them. Um, and they claim it has a 50 year lifespan. Uh, a couple of years ago, when it was first coming out, and I kind of used to joke with her and say, 
it's good for 50 years, but your company's only good for, you know, been around for five. How did you figure that? But nevertheless, uh, they've done the test and the way they pasteurize it or model it in a sense that it's good for 50 years. So that's one of the things is you can buy a case of that water in cans and put it away and you'll be good for your water supply for work. Uh, emergency contact information. So here, especially in the businesses, um, you know, you should be collecting this information and somebody in HR or your emergency response team needs to be able to have that information to be able to deal with it. One of the key things is a out of state contact. So the way the telephone network used to be designed is local calls and the local exchange would jam up much more than the long distance call. So you can make a long distance call and get through versus a local call you may not be able to. And so as a result, it's always good to find a out of state contact, uh, whether it be a relative, whether it be a coworker, or whether it be a friend that you know, something like that. So that's one of the key things that you wanna be able to do. And then be able to collect any medical information. Now, this is a fine line of collecting HIPAA information and making sure the person is safe. But it would be nice to know if they need, if they have an EpiPen or if they have asthma and they have an inhaler. Those are the types of things that it would be nice to be able to be at least be aware of so that you can help and support them for their medical needs. You don't need a complete medical history of the person. So after the disaster, we start the rebuilding. And so once everybody's safe, you're gonna sit there and figure out now what? And depending on what happens and where you're at, is where's my business? How safe is it? And what's going on with it? Uh, identify people that can do the job because now all of a sudden people that used to be able to job either can't get there or they have priorities obviously with their family uh, or they might have been affected by the disaster in the first place. So you need to be able to figure out how do I keep the business going? Uh, alternate locations. So I work for a small startup in Camarillo and it was like 10 PhDs, myself and an uh, office admin person. And we were doing stuff in the telecom industry. And one of the very large telecom people was starting to use our product. And their team came out and looked at our small little office. And again, it was a pretty small little office building, uh, office that we had. And he looked around and he says, okay. And he basically said, we're gonna pick you guys up, your clean room, all of your stuff, and pick you up and move you to one of our facilities in another state as a part of our disaster recovery plan. And he goes, I know that we're not your only customer. I know that you sell to our competitors, but you are critical to my business right now that you're a part that I need to make my system work, that I'm going to sit there and co-locate you at my site, because that's how they felt that that's one of the ways they could do it, because if not, he had no other way of ensuring that we could still continue to deliver product to him. So those are some of the things that you want to be able to do. So co-locating with your partners or customers, you'll be surprised if you're a small company that they need you and you need them. So you'll be surprised on how open some of these larger companies are to helping you be successful. So you need to have those tough discussions before disaster happens, because afterwards you're going to be into trouble. Um, again, alternate data storage sites for all of your information. The cloud is making it a lot easier, but those that grew up in high tech know the cloud is not a safe and friendly place. So you want to make sure you pick and choose how you offsite things. I think you know, you, tomorrow is just going to be on ransomware, and what people are doing is infecting data, and they're letting it go into the backup and affecting the backups and then the backups after that. And so now when you go to recover, they wait months and then they strike and now you have a problem. So you need to sit there and think about how can I recover my data and do things. So I'm not sure if tomorrow's talk gonna talk about that, but that's an issue that people need to be aware of. Um, and then moving to storage companies. As I said, that uh, company that was in Simi Valley, one of the vice presidents found a moving guy got in the passenger seat and smiled and said, guess what? I'm not getting out of this car or this truck until you can come and move us. And it was a couple of days, but the guy spent the days driving around. He wanted to make sure that they were able to make that happen, which is kind of cool. So you have to ask yourself, 
where is it going to work? You know, and again, depending on what you do and what type of work you do, this may not be an issue. You can work at your home or another place, but a lot of buildings during a wildfire, during a disaster are going to have a problem. And so those are things that you need to be able to do. Uh, what am I going to drive and how am I going to get there? So this was off the Northridge earthquake where the second floor became the first floor and everything underneath it kind of got mushed. And so how are you going to do it? How are you going to go around it? So these are some issues, things like this. Uh, this is one that's really like the thing is, okay, where am I going to spend the night? The fire doesn't care. It's going to take everything out. I also think it's kind of ironic that the only thing standing is the fireplace, but nevertheless, um, this is Malibu. This happened a couple of years ago in my brother-in-law's neighborhood in um, uh, Oak Park and uh, Morrison Ranch. There's another person we know that an ember flew in the air, landed inside a vent pipe of his house. It nestled in uh, the attic and turned into a fire and burnt his whole attic out. And he was out of the house for six months to a year while they had to rebuild the whole house. The smoke damage was there, the fire damage was there. The, the fires in Malibu have de devastated things. It's two and a half to three years to build a new house in this area, just going through the permits, going through the process uh, for all of that. So these are things can happen in a wildfire, it happened as we saw in Thousand Oaks just a couple of years back, where they were on um, Herbs Road burning things down. They were off, off of Lindero Canyon burning things down. There was fires up off of Canaan Roads that were burning houses down. So you don't have to be out in the woods in the forest to get burnt down from wildfires. It's here now. Uh, Northern California some fire again. We've got half a dozen fires currently raging here in Southern California. Fortunately, there are none right here in the Thousand Oaks area. Um, during the big fire a couple of years ago off of Herbs Road, I was uh, with Thousand Oaks Dart and I was stationed at an intersection, Avenue de Flores and Herbs. And I could see the fire just down the street. And I was watching fire trucks come back and forth, trying to do things uh, up by my brother in law's house off of you know, Oak Park, off of Canaan. Um, the fire were burning. Houses were burning down, and the fire trucks left because they said, "Well, this house is total. There's no one hurt, so we're leaving." And the neighbors are sitting there with their little garden hoses, trying to keep the burning embers from going to their yard. And it's just they were overrun, and they can only do so much. The fire department they had huge amount of resources. There were fire departments from San Bernardino. There were fire departments from up in Santa Barbara. You know, they bring in the resources. When you have fires that's so diverse as they were a couple of years ago across the Southern California or Thousand Oaks area, they cannot all be at one place at one time. So it was pretty, pretty devastating. So the question you have here is what was salvageable? Did they have a place to, to get their valuables and their pictures, their documents out of this? Did they, you know, come in? To some degree, we have a little bit of warning with wildfires but not enough for you to sit there and start to think about what you need to do. If you know what to do, and during the fire season, you can pack things up in a bag, in a box, and be ready, that's the best thing to do. Uh, real quick on parking, you should always park into a parking spot where you can drive out. The Boy Scouts have that as a rule of thumb, and there was a uh, scouting event uh, in the far west end of Simi, that um, basically were, these people are camping, but the rule is you're always back into the parking spot and a fire came up and over the hill and the, the adult leaders just literally grabbed kids, threw them in the car and drove out because they were single file, they were able to get out pretty quick, but it took out their tents and their camping gear. Uh, but fortunately no one was hurt. So I always make it a rule that I can pull out without having to back out. If you have to back out of a parking spot and you get 10, 15, 20 people trying to do that, you've got a major traffic collision, traffic jam up. So just think about where you're at, what you want to do. So this is the part that's supposed to scare you. You want to be part of the problem or part of the solution. So this is pictures from Katrina and basically people that had lost their homes and were not able to go back to where they live. And they basically got online for breakfast, as you can see down here. 
And by the time they got breakfast, they had to get back online for lunch. And by the time they got lunch, they had to get back online for dinner. Then they had to get in line to find a place to sleep in the uh, Superdome there. And they did that day after day after day after day. So you have to ask yourself, do you want to be this person here or this person here or this person here or right here? It's your decision. You have to decide do you want to be part of the problem or part of the solution. And the more that you can prepare, the more that you can be self-resilient and self-sufficient, it's going to make a difference on whether or not you are one of these people here. This is insane. This is, I could not survive that. So you need kits uh, for every place. You need one for the home, one for your car, one for work and for school. Uh, and it's basic supplies. Uh, you need a good pair of, of shoes because you might have to walk a distance depending where you're going. You need water and you need snacks. So my car, I have lots of snacks and lots of water. And again, uh, you know, sometimes it's just bottled water or have some of that uh, blue can water, which is good for 50 years. I have a couple pieces of that. But basically, that's where I have. A lot of the schools have supplies. And it was a good thing. Usually, the parent teacher association or whatever they're calling it get money. They get a big 20 foot trailer in the back of the, the schoolyard and they set it up and everything's great. But then no one ever, ever goes in there and looks at the supply. No one ever checks to make sure it's still good. It was a great fundraiser. We set it up. We have a checkbox that our kids are safe. But guess what? Next year, the year after, the year after. No one's going in there to see where it's at. Uh, so you can also have uh, many personal kits for your family. So just, again, you want to be part of the solution or part of the problem. If the disaster will strike, and they do strike, and it's how comfortable do you want to be? In my kit, uh, our son has grown now, but when he was younger, we had a deck of cards. And if you have multiple kids, you need a deck of cards if you want to pull one out and let them play a game of war or some card game and see how long it takes them to figure out that you're missing a card. But it's nevertheless, you need to have things for the kids to do that does not require batteries or electricity. Um, the next one is why the food issue? My house is fine. We don't have a problem in Thousand Oaks. Oh, there's a problem in Northridge Road. Basically, people will come like locusts to our stores and they will just take everything off the shelves. Uh, people will hoard this wise. And again, how many stories did we hear about people hoarding toilet paper and water and other supply? It, it happens. It's just in the nature of people. And so again, if you already have your supplies in place, you don't have to go out and fight for that. You can sit there with your supply and be there. Well, one of the problems is the delivery trucks aren't going to be able to resupply. The truck drivers are not going to be able to get there. Their roads are going to be closed, depending on the disaster, depending on the situation. The person selling the products might be affected because depending if it's a wildfire, it's in their area or the freeways are closed or what's going on. Or you may not be able to get out of your neighborhood. There's a lot of times where they're telling you people that we have a major problem with fires. And again, a couple of years ago with those fires, they were encouraging people just to stay home and keep off the roads to allow the fire trucks to go back and forth in different places. Uh, sometimes it lasts for a couple of days or days, sometimes it's a couple of days. So a lot depends on what's happening and where you're at. But this, we just see this time and time and time again on all the different disasters. And this isn't even the big earthquake. These are just the little ones. Um, water. You cannot have enough water. And people say, oh, I got a huge swimming pool. Yeah, you cannot drink your pool water. Uh, pool water is good for cleansing and cleaning up, but you will not be able to, to really drink it or you shouldn't be drinking it. And I don't even think, and I would not encourage you to try boiling it, as you do have a lot of chemicals in the pool. Um, I have a 50 gallon drum of water that's good for five years. And then and after that, I empty it, my grass gets a good wash and I fill it up again. I also have two cases of water and I rotate it constantly. So when one is down, I put the next one there, I go out and buy another one, 
and I just keep the rotation uh, for that. And there should be no reason why everybody doesn't have two cases of water that sits under your dresser, anywhere you can put it. Um, food. So, again, you're not going to be able to get a lot of food, uh, depending on what's happening. Flour magically disappeared during the pandemic, along with yeast. And it took months and months for yeast. Hence, the big craving of sourdough bread. Uh, I was the victim of that. Well, I didn't. I had yeast, but I got did get caught up in the sourdough baking because I could make my own sourdough starter, and I made lots of great sourdough bread. Uh, so again, it was kind of a cool thing, but you'll be surprised what disappears off the shelf. Uh, Easy Mac or micro macaroni and cheese. It has a shelf life like Twinkies, like forever. And you don't need a microwave to use it. You can boil the noodles and add the cheese, and you have mac and cheese, which is wonderful. There are some pancake mixes that <clears throat> just need water. Uh, not quite as good as Bisquick, but I make lots of things with just Bisquick. Uh, so that's my miracle thing. So it goes with that. You can look at the REI and other camping stores. Uh, camp food, it tastes good. I can vouch that the freeze dried cheesecake is delicious and wonderful, but it has a tendency to be a little bit expensive. So there are times when I go shopping at the shoe store, I really don't look at the label as far as what I'm buying. I look at the expiration date and it's like, can I tolerate eating this? Oh, wait, it has a five year life here. I'm definitely buying that. And so I do that, and then on the outside of the can with a Sharpie, I write in big letters the month in the year and make sure that I recycle that. So if you look at my cabinet right now, there is soup, there is chili, uh, there's tuna fish packets, all sit there on what the shelf life is, and many of them have, like I said, years to do it and just rotate it. If you buy stuff that you're not wild about, but you said it has a good shelf life, before the expiration date, you can feel good and donate it to a food shelter. So just make sure it doesn't go to waste. Um, outdoor cooking. Uh, you can cook almost anything on a barbecue grill. I probably have not cooked meat in my house in the last 15 years. We just had lamb chops today on the grill. This next uh, Sunday, we're having friends over and we're putting a turkey on the grill. Try to ribs, steak, fish, lobster, I do not, my oven only basically does bread. Um, I have a propane grill and I have four or five tanks because it's the same that my generator uses propane and I don't have to deal with gasoline. And so I have tons of tanks. Um, if you live in Newberry Park or around Newberry Park, the Walmart off of N2 Boulevard, uh, their propane is the cheapest around, but more importantly, it's a self-serve open 24 hours a day. You come in, you put in your credit card, and a door magically opens. You put the empty there, you close it, then another door magically opens with a full tank, and off you go. So there should be no reason why you do, you're do. you out of natural gas. I usually wait until I have one or two out of my five tanks, but I recycle those, and I constantly have that. You might have propane connected to your house uh, or natural gas. A lot of those can be uh, converted. The problem is the natural gas um, may get shut off or be disconnected depending on the situation. And we'll talk about that in a second. And then I also have a charcoal grill with a backup. Uh, you know, obviously cooking and stuff like that has to be done outdoors, but at the same time, there's amazing what you can do. You can boil water, you can cook just about anything, vegetables, meat. It's just something that you should really consider. Uh, one of the things I want to make sure you do is you don't forget about your pets. Uh, they need food and toys. So we have uh, two wonderful little uh, cats. And I probably have about uh, six or seven bags of 20 to 30 pound bags of kitty litter. Uh, we have tons of food for them so they can survive. And then again, they have the water that we can get from our 50 gallon tank. Of, of water. So again, just keep in mind what's going on with them and being able to address them if they're on many medications or anything like that, where they're at and what's going on. 
Um, so you want to make sure your house is safe, uh, especially from earthquakes. Uh, one of the things that we've done is we found the studs in the wall. We put an eye bolt in and then we run a chain from there and then attach it to the bookcases, the china cabinets and things like that, uh, which was rather interesting because when we moved out, we kind of left the eye bolts and the chain in the wall. And people might have thought we were running a little s and fun place there, but nevertheless, uh, it helps secure the furniture, especially the bigger bookcases and the bigger china cabinets. Um, think about what you're putting in there. The uh, put the heavy items in the lower area, and go room to room and make sure that there's a safe place to go if you need to go. Is it under the bed in a closet? Think about what you've got. Uh, a little off topic, but at the same time, if you look under your kitchen sink and underneath in your laundry room, it is a hazmat site. You've got. Clorox bleach, you've got the little pods for either the dishwasher or the Tide pods for uh, doing your uh, laundry. You've got cleaner, all of that stuff is down at kid level. And you say, oh, but I have childproof locks. I just remember when we had childproof locks on ours and I'm trying to open up a cabinet and my son was maybe 18 months old. He comes running over, Dad, I'll help you. And his little fingers went in and undid the childproof locks. Uh, they were gold proof, as far as I was concerned. Uh, there are some that use little magnets, which are a little safer, but you always seem to lose the magnet, uh, to release the magnet, and now you're frustrated because you can't get to what you want. But I really encourage you to tonight, after this talk, look underneath your kitchen sink, look in your laundry room, and do it. You say, oh, I don't have kids. I don't have to deal with that. Well, maybe you have kids that have friends. Maybe you now have grandkids. Maybe you have friends that have kids that are coming over. If it is something, they will find it. And so it's it's an avoidable thing that you can do is just think about what you've got and where you're at. Uh, so the basic tools um, underneath my bed is a uh, pair of shoes. Uh, because glass will break, whether it's from windows, picture frames, cabinets coming over, uh, a pair of work gloves. Uh, I also have a very large crowbar. Uh, so people might wonder why I have that, but nevertheless, uh, I don't have the hammer wrench up there anymore, but nevertheless, you should have those accessible. You should have a flashlight because when it gets dark, it's going to get dark and you're going to want to see what's going on. So just, again, simple things that can be kept there uh, to be able to do that. Uh, I have a friend of mine that was caught up in an earthquake or more, more earthquake a while back, quite a few years ago, and he was very fortunate because then that night the, they had a dinner party at his house, and all the fine china was in the dishwasher and was safe from breakage because he looked over and his china cabinet was totally destroyed laying on the ground. And so as they put all the china back in the cabinet. He would have lost all of that. And if I recall, it was his uh, heirloom from handed down from his grandparents or something like that. So again, he was lucky, but think about how you're securing your different things. Uh, learn where your utilities are. And this is the case not only for any of the disasters, including wildfires and others, it's what's your gas shut off. Uh, we have a wrench that can be used to shut off the gas, but I have to caution you, if you shut off your gas, is not going to be able to turn it back on the way it's designed with some sort of a, a vacuum system that you cannot turn it back on. And so it could be days and weeks and maybe months before the gas company comes out to turn your gas back on. You can get some automatic shutoffs. Uh, they've gotten better. The first generation uh, would get triggered when a large dump truck came down the street. So be aware of that. The newer ones are much better, but just Think about what you need to do and be aware of it. Be prepared to shut off your gas, but just be aware of it. Uh, turning off your main water pipe from your house, uh, I would encourage you to find it and test it every so often. Uh, a couple of houses ago, we were doing a complete kitchen remodel and I turned off the water from the house, uh, from the street. And this was Saturday night and went to turn it back on, and it didn't want to turn back on. It just spun to its hard content. And I was completely covered in 
dirt and grime and stuff, and I just jumped in the pool to clean off. But and then on a Sunday now, if you have a plumber come out, you basically are paying premiums. Most of the stores are closed. And I rapidly came to the conclusion that they put the water shut off and the pressure relief valve in. Then they built the house completely around it. If they're if it was a very tight fit, just to replace it, but you were able to do it. Electricity, uh, know where your uh, electrical panel is, uh, know how to reset the panels, how to uh, properly do it. So if there's a power outage, you want to shut everything off and then turn on your main and then slowly bring things on as you do it, or else uh, you'll have an overload. So again, just know where they are. You should uh, take the time and label the panels, uh, each breaker, so you know where they go. Some are essential and some are not. So just be aware of what you're doing, but you, you need to know your utilities and know how to deal with them. Um, again, hygiene, uh, there may not be water to your house. Uh, if we're lucky, they'll put a pumper truck or you'll get access to a fire hydrant potentially, and every five to 10 houses, there'll be a water spigot. We will turn into a third um, country really quick uh, if uh, third world country if if we're not careful uh, what would happen I have a portable toilet uh, baby wipes plastic bags and I show up I'll show you a picture of that one um, the problem is people say well how come there's no water well around Thousand Oaks area if you look up on the hillside tucked away there are reservoirs and those are gravity fed to your homes but there are pumps that pump water up to the uh, reservoirs and if those pumps fail because either they don't have electricity or the generators are not working and they will run eventually out of fuel even if they have um, they are working initially then you're not going to get water to your home and so those are things that you need to be aware of um, again preparing these are just common sense types of that we live in a data-driven world whether it be the pictures, your documents, your life, it's all on data. And how prepared am I? How many people back up their laptop computer from home? How many times do they back up their laptop from work? And are they doing it effectively? And how many people have tried to recover from a backup system? Most people, when they try it, all of a sudden realize, oh, it doesn't work. The backup software that I thought was there and I've been backing up is not compatible with the new system and the new drivers and all different reasons why it can't work. And so now all of a sudden you have a lot of backed up data that cannot be backed up or recovered. Uh, photos, um, you may want to go through and take pictures of every room in your house. If there's a wildfire and other things that destroy everything, you need to prove that I had this furniture in there. You have some receipts, you have different things like that. Uh, check your insurance. Am I covered under fire? Lots of Thousand Oaks is in there a fire area or a flood area. And so you need to know, do I need an additional insurance policy to cover the flyer or the flood or areas like that? So just take a second, look at where you are, what your situation is. What is your business insurance? Do I have adequate where I'm at? Um, fireproof storage is important for important items. So again, we have a uh, fireproof safe uh, that is rating for that, and not only for the fire, but also for the water, for water damage. Um, a lot of times the safes are not waterproof or waterproof enough to be able to store stuff. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we do is we have things that we want to keep and we have enough in our attic. I have things that I put it in a plastic trash bag and seal that and put that into a cardboard box. The reason for it is that if it floods or I have water damage, then at least what's inside the plastic bag has a better chance of surviving. Um, my son was storing some stuff at uh, his cousin's house. The cousin had it in the Midwest. It was uh, stored in the basement, the water pipe leak. And stuff that he bought was say all got damaged because uh, he didn't choose to put it in a plastic bag like I asked him to in the cardboard box. So I guess you know. Um, this came from uh, Richard Gray. Uh, he's a member of the IEEE, and he basically saw that we were giving this talk. So he sent me 
kind of a neat little uh, thing that what he does. And so I'm going to kind of update you on some of the things that he's done. Uh, he evidently lives in Malibu. Uh, and so he was sharing some of the things that he's done. So basically, if, depending on where you're space, if you're in the lowlands and you're in a typical track, you don't have a lot of, of land. In our old house off of uh, Lindero Canyon, mm -hmm. our backyard opened up to uh, open space. So we did have more than 100 feet of open space of where things were going to go. There's no doubt that when the fire comes down those hills, it is going to come and hit lawn furniture, your beach umbrellas, your lawn furniture, and a lot of that is just plastic, and it's going to catch up and just burn your trash cans and things, all those types of stuff. You need to think about how safe is my house, how much space do I have, and a lot of houses go up because they didn't remove enough of the debris around their houses. Uh, again, parking your vehicle in a clearing or a fire resistant place. Uh, if you're caught into a fire and you're up in the mountains, just be aware that your car engine does not work as well as you think in a whole bunch of smoke. There's been lots of people that have been driving out and the intake valve from the, the, for the fire, your, your car is just not getting adequate oxygen and you've got some problems. But the biggest takeaway take away I got from Richard was this one here down in red. You need a large sign, like a four by eight sheet of plywood that basically says, bring beer for firefighters. And so the goal is, yes, we appreciate the firefighter, but you wanna make sure that they know which house to save first. Because if there's nice cold beer, guess what? They're gonna wanna save it. Um, on the board of BICEP is uh, one of the emergency managers for the Getty Center. And he constantly shares stories when there's fires up by the Getty Center. And basically they opened up the Getty Center for the firefighters to rest, for the firefighters to uh, eat, to sleep, uh, and get cleaned up because there were a couple of places for them to shower. Uh, fortunately, the artwork is all in purified air and it was safe. But uh, the bottom line is, is you have to think about when people are putting out wildfire, where are they gonna stay? The more you can do for them, the nicer and the easier it is. So just good to make friends in the right places. So, uh, to kind of talk about the solution, this is uh, me in my old backyard. Uh, again, my part is I could hang out there for a long time. Uh, I've got my little lounge chair, I've got my tent, my little porta potty here, and on my table is just some of the stuff I have. I have a, a little stove with camping thing. I have a water purifier. I've got a backup propane little grill so I can cook meats. I've got my ham radio. I've got a powder powder radio that I can crank it. Lots of fuel. The toilet uh, I've upgraded now, so I have a I have actually two little porta potties, which are kind of nice. One, uh, both of them have little tents that you can put it in. But in there, plastic bags that collect the the waste, um, baby wipes, gloves, paper towels, all individually sealed toilet paper, all individual seals in its own little plastic. And when it's not in use, I can put all of that supplies in the bucket and off we go. This will make all sorts of new friends if you have to shelter in place or all of a sudden we don't have water and we don't have issues with that. So one of the things just to be aware of. Um, there are some really great resources. Uh, obviously the American Red Cross, their function is to uh, feed and shelter people. If there is a house fire, the American Red Cross gets notified along with the fire department and they will show up at a fire and depending on the situation, they will uh, ensure that the people's house, do they have a place to go? Uh, do they have the finances to afford their own hotel capabilities? If they don't, they have the ability to issue uh, credit cards or the ability to give them money to stay at a hotel. If it's a multi-dwelling or more than one home is affected, they have the ability to set up a shelter and depending on what's going on. Uh, setting up shelters for wildfires is now, at least last year, was an issue because of the COVID and how did they deal that? So between the Medical Reserve Corps, the American Red Cross and a couple other organizations, uh, we participated in 
some plans and drills on how we can open up the team center or the global center in Thousand Oaks and adequately be able to shelter people that were displaced from the homes. The American Heart Association uh, has a lot of information. Uh, CERT, which is, is an emergency response, and the T could either be training or team. It initially starts out as a training, uh, and that's given by the fire department. It's free, and we call it about eight weeks, and it's a wonderful set of training. Everybody should go through the class, uh, our old neighborhood, our next door neighbor, she and I, I went with the class with her, and she admitted she goes, I am not going to save anybody else, but I want to be able to save myself. Her husband was working downtown at the time, and so she, again, was in fire area or earthquake area, and she goes, I want to be able to do it. And part of the drill, we learned basic first aid, we learned fire extinguisher, we learned what to do around the home to make it safe. And so that confidence and that just doing those skills was just huge for her. Um, the T uh, can then turn to a team. So depending on where you are, there's an Agora Hill CERD. There's a Westlake Village uh, DRT team, disaster response team. Uh, Thousand Oaks is the disaster response team. Uh, the One of the things to get onto the DART team is you have to be a, gone through CERD, and then you go through an additional eight, 10 weeks of additional training uh, and get all the gear and stuff like that. Camarillo has a DART team. A lot of the beach communities out in Oxnard have their own little community response teams, if it were. Uh, so those are some of the key things that you got. Uh, BICEP, Business Industry Council for Emergency Beach Planning and Preparedness. And we think that they came up with that name at a breakfast meeting beyond me. But it was formed back when Mayor Bradley was still the mayor. And he recognized that he needed a forum for the public sector and the private sector to be able to get together and understand and work with each other. The private sector cannot survive without the public sector, and the public sector cannot survive without the businesses in the private sector. And so on the current board right now, we have members from the Getty, NBC Universal, uh, the LA City EOC, Emergency Operations Center, LA County, uh, we've got, uh, consultants and vendors that are on the team. Uh, and it's really nice that we can network with each other and kind of get there. So there are people that will at least see my phone because it's in their phone, will answer it at the LA City EOC. And yeah, they'll be busy, but they'll take my call eventually. So those are things you got. US Department of Homeland Security, again, has these huge amounts of information, booklets and programs and putting together the plans. Um, just to mention a few SOS products, uh, they sell disaster supplies. Uh, so he happens to be on the board also with Bicep, but you can get stuff online. You can go there and look to see what you want and then buy stuff online. Sorry, Jeff, I can't just support you. Uh, but basically, a lot of it is common sense stuff that you can get at Walmart, Costco, Home Depot, Lowe's, all those types of stuff. Obviously, my company. Uh, we do most things in emergency planning and OSHA health and safety. Uh, there's a book of the unthinkable from Amanda Ripley, which is a, an awesome book. It was you read through it and you can start to see why and how people survive. Uh, one of the studies and stories she did was back when the uh, powers came down, there was one company where the site president of security basically said, I'm going to teach everybody how to get out of the building. And they were up in the 50 some odd floor. And they, every quarter or so, he did a field trip and everybody left their office and they went down a set of steps. And like a lot of high rises, especially the Twin Towers, you go down a bunch of floors, then you have to cross over to another set of staircases and another part of the building and go down and then back and forth. And they were the only people that knew how to exit the building without using the other band. And everybody in that company survived with the exception of two people. And those two people went back into the building to help other people. And that's when they, they perished. But everybody else survived because they had a plan. He drilled, he educated the people and people knew, knew what to do and how to do things. So 
right now in Southern California, if you are caught without toilet paper, if you're caught without food, you're caught without water, you go look in the mirror, and that's what you need to blame. It's no one else's fault. Everybody knows that there are disasters. Everybody knows that it happens here in Southern California. Everybody knows that when something happens, things are going to disappear off the shelves. It's it's a given. And so you have to decide do you want to be part of the problem or part of the solution. And so that's my plan and I'm sticking to it. All right. Thank you. That was a, that was a lot of really good information. So, folks, uh, once again, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in the Q and A window. Um, uh, if it asks you for who to send it to, just send it to all participants, and I will I will uh, sort it out. Uh, the first question comes from me. <laughs> well, people are are trying to find where the the Q and A box is. It's, sometimes it's hidden behind the three dot menu. Um, so. For folks who live in condominiums or apartments, are there any unique um, things that we should think about? So, a lot of having to do is uh, your shared utilities, depending on where you're at with the community. So, you have to be careful that somebody doesn't proactively shut stuff off when they shouldn't. But you also need to know how to do it if you want to do it proactively. The dilemma you have with small apartments and condominiums is space. You just don't have space to put a 50 gallon jar of water. You right. don't have place to put your supply. But you do underneath your shoes in your closet, you can put case of, uh, two cases of water, cinder block, and put your shoes on a piece of wood above that. So at least you have some water and some supplies. Uh, there are some things that you can do as far as taking uh, allocating a closet or a portion of a closet to be able to put some of your supplies there. You also have the option of pairing up with your neighbors. If you know neighbors and you're friendly with your neighbors, and so you can kind of do a joint thing and being able to pool your supply. So a lot of the condominiums and apartments have like a storage locker that's available for you, typically mm -hmm. for the parking and stuff like that. And so individually, you probably couldn't put everything you want along with all the other stuff that you need to store in there. But if you have five people and each person gets a piece of it, then you have the capability of sharing a little bit. You also uh, should put together a plan to not only are you safe, but are your neighbors safe? And so you can look and be kind of like the watch commander on that floor or that capability to sit there and say, you know, not only am I going to look after me, I'm going to look after my neighbors. I'm going to look to see if there's any neighbors with disability um, or have some issues with walking or in wheelchairs. You know, what is the plan for that? Um, there are different things that as the homeowner association or condominium association, you can get, it's like a, it's called like a sked and it's a picture of a plastic, piece of plastic that can be folded up uh, or wrapped around a person and you can bring them down a pair of stairs. So that if you have somebody that is in a wheelchair on the second or third floor and they always use the elevator, uh, this is something that you can use to get them safely down a set of flight steps. So, you know, you put a rope on it and you can ease the person down. Those are relatively inexpensive uh, and you can mount those in the staircase or near the stairwell uh, to be able to do something like that. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, I, I can. Tell you from personal experience, I lived in an apartment building once and uh, we had a water break, a pipe break, and nobody <laughs> knew how to turn the water off. And it was right, it was like it, behind a bush. It was totally accessible. And uh, you know what? <laughs> yeah. And, and there's two parts of it. One, I may know where it is, but I don't have a wrench to turn it off. And mm -hmm. so, again, so the wrenches are, are relatively uh, inexpensive. A tool is relatively inexpensive. A lot of times, the water company, um, we haven't done them for a couple of years, but there are community fairs, and a lot of times, the water company has a piece of metal with a slot in it that's designed to be able to turn off the water or turn off the gas. And so they hand those out as a promo. So again, they're, but not having one can make a huge difference. Yeah. yeah. 
A uh, question from uh, El Shi: How do you uh, prepare for uh, personal security? So there's a lot of different ways, and so on one side, um, Glock is a good friend of mine, and all of his little nine mil buddies. Uh, that's one way of preparing for it. I know people have different views of that, so we won't go too deep into that. Um, but that's one way. Uh, the biggest is situation awareness. Um, just know where you are, what your surrounding is. You're going into an ATM machine and it's getting dark. Look around where do you see cars pulling up. You see things going into it. You know, go to well lit areas. Um, one of the areas that if you think you're being followed, for example, with road rage uh, on the car, uh, one of the tricks you can do is go to a hotel like the Four Seasons and start blasting your horn because they have valet parking or a restaurant you know has valet parking. And basically what will happen is there'll be people there to help protect you in that area. So that's one trick if you uh, feel threatened in your car. Uh, going to a police station uh, doesn't always work, especially the East uh, County Sheriff Station. Uh, after hours, after five o'clock, uh, some doors locked. So <laughs> come back tomorrow. No crime tonight. Uh, and so that's not a great place to go. There is a phone uh, that connects to the jail uh, or the holding center down there. But the bottom line is, I would go to find a well-lit gas station or a well-lit store or place that has valet parking where there are people that you could beat the horn and sound the alarm, but people can come out. Um, Mace, I don't have any, so I don't, can't really comment on that. Um, just know where you're going and what you're doing uh, and being aware of it. Thanks. Uh, what are your thoughts on electrical generators for backup power for residential homes? So, uh, how, uh, well, there's more. How much fuel to store on site and whether you'd recommend solar power instead of regular fuel powered? Okay, so if you have solar energy to your house right now, and, and this just happened with a friend of mine, who spent a lot of money and he, he loves solar panels in his house. The way, at least his design, is when you lose power to the grid, it shuts off the power of the solar to the house. And so even though he had wonderful solar power, he wasn't able to do it. Now, there's lots of technology coming out with battery power and, and electrical storage sources um, local. Uh, what I have is I have a generator. It's a three fuel generator. It runs off of gas, off of propane and natural gas. And I have five propane gas tanks that I use. And once a month, I kick it on and I start it. A couple, about two months ago, uh, we are part of the Edison you shut your power off and save lots of money thing. And they shut power off and it was off for four or five hours. And we cut the generator on and we ran a few extension cords and we're able to run fans and electrical things. You can go to the extent of wiring it into your panel, your electrical panel, and there's a couple of different ways of doing that uh, with an electrician, but one is uh, a bypass and one is, um, you know, I either I'm on the grid or on my generator and it gets wired into your panel and there's others where I can do selected breakers. Um, but I chose to go with uh, propane versus gasoline because I don't have to store gasoline. Gasoline does have a shelf life. Propane, I'm using the same tanks for my, my uh, barbecue outside. So I'm using that up and I have the spare tanks for that. So I'm not sure exactly what the shelf life of propane is, but it's, uh, it seems to be a little better than gasoline. Yeah. Costco, Walmart, Home Depot, Lowe's, they all sell uh, the little generators to, to go. Again, you need to make sure you use that in a well ventilated area. Uh, mine is a, a 220 and a 110. Uh, in my old house, I had to do uh, fix the wide iron fence in the front, and I put it on a little uh, trailer and drove it down and started up. And my friend had his welder, and we welded the fence because we were using the 220 from it. So it has some other practical uses other than just your backup capabilities. <laughs> yes, so. Uh, regarding storage of emergency food, I had heard not to store some stuff uh, in the garage of a two-story house since it may not be accessible in a disaster like an earthquake. Storing outside exposes food to heat, etc. I tried to construct a root cellar to keep it cooler. 
<laughs> but had difficulty with flooding. So do you have any insight on how and where to store your emergency food? Right. So there's no doubt that uh, if you store it in your house and your house gets destroyed, you're going to have a problem. There's, there's no doubt about that. Outdoor is good. So what I do is I have a couple of uh, these big tough lock boxes. Uh, and I also have buckets with lids that can screw on. So they're like the five gallon bucket with a screw lid uh, that makes it, let's call it bear proof or animal proof if it were. Uh, and then inside is the plastic baggies to keep things separated and stuff like that. There's no doubt you can't do a whole lot with temperature. Uh, so you have to pick and choose your food that can withstand moderate temperature ranges. Okay. Um, and that's kind of what I do. So I have, I guess, had a couple of those storage boxes uh, that I have my supplies, my pots and pans from the camping days and the food in those. And I just circulate it the best I can. The other is try to find a, a closet that's near the front door or easy exit that you can maybe find your way through it. Like if you in your garage, maybe right by the garage door, not the main one, you know, your one you bring your cars in, but the side one, uh, try to find something right near there because you might be able to break open the stucco or the sheetrock or whatever and get to some of that supplies. All right. Uh, I don't see any other questions in the Q and a box. Um, Natalie, I know you're muted. Do you have any other uh, last words before we, uh, before we go? I just want to thank you. Thank everyone for being part of this event tonight. I want to thank you, Ross, for a fantastic talk. I am scared. I'm going to change a lot of things <laughs> and I really appreciate all the guidance and I will be prepared for okay. the next disaster. So we're going to see you tomorrow at Costco buying your case of toilet paper. No, I'm all set. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Oh. All right. All right. Yeah. So thank you. My pleasure. Thank you very much. And I wish everyone a good evening. Thanks everybody. All right.